Thank you to the worship team. Thank you, Kayla, Kristen, Lonnie. Really, really appreciate your, uh, the songs, the song selection. And uh, we want to pick up kind of on that theme, <clears throat> in fact. Uh, welcome to everyone on the live stream. Uh, welcome to everyone here. We're glad you could be with us. Happy uh, New Year. Um, a lot of people go through and they, they look at 2021 and they say, that was a dumpster fire. And then they say, well, 2022 is going to be better. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but our hope is not in the year. Our hope is in the Lord. That's where we place our hope, right? There's nothing that can come against us if our hope is in God. So I uh, just wanted to give some, uh, some welcomes to everyone here and to online and uh, just jump into uh, his word in just a minute. So um, re- recently I've been talking about the idea, and it's really been over the past year off and on, been talking about this idea of, of Jesus uh, in treating God as king. We are not um, a, a, a people in the United States that, that knows much about kings, nor has much respect for kings. Um, and, and I don't want to rehash that too much, but I want to look at an aspect of, of God, an aspect of Jesus, that will help us to see him maybe a little bit better. And um, when we look at Jesus, we, we say a lot to keep our eyes on Jesus, right? If we say, let's look at Jesus, let's keep our eyes and our focus on him so that we won't focus on the things of the earth, the things in the world. There's a few ways to do that. One of the ways, and it's one of the ways that the, the psalmist did, um, was to look at his law, his statutes, his judgments, judgments, his ordinances. And in those things, you're able to see the heart of God. But I want to look for something else that the psalmist looked at um, and I'd say people throughout the Bible looked at and that is the beauty and the majesty and the glory of the Lord. And that's what we want to focus and talk about today is the beauty and the majesty of God. There are aspects and descriptions of his beauty and his majesty throughout the Bible. We're going we're gonna to read a lot of passages today. But man, mankind has this longing in him for beauty. Ecclesiastes 3 Verse 11, if we want to turn there. Ecclesiastes 3.11. Where it says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, not of his creation, that is. Except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. So God has put in this, this uh, he's created things beautiful in their time, and he has created this longing for something in our hearts. It says eternity here, but you could also replace it, not, not because of the language, but you could say uh, that he has, there's this, this longing for beauty. Psalm 27, and verse 4. Quick. Psalm 27, and verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, Yahweh, all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This craving we have for beauty is at its most basic desire. At its most basic can be explained as we have a craving for God. We have a crave, craving for God in our hearts. There's a, I don't remember who said this, but there's a God-shaped hole in our hearts. That that's the only thing that can fill what's missing for us. And you see all these different expressions of how this plays out. You see in the art, you see in the music, you see in architecture. You see this desire to create, and you don't just see the desire to create. You see the desire for man throughout millennia and time, go back to antiquities, to create things that are beautiful. When we create things that are beautiful, I would propose that they're done for two reasons. Either to glorify God or to glorify someone or something else. And so, we see people building, we see people constructing, we see uh, music composed, we see some of the most beautiful things that we can't have in our human experience. They're done, most often, the things that are the most beautiful were done to honor the glory of God. Think of the, 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 composer, uh, the uh, composition handles uh, Messiah and the Hallelujah Chorus, one of the most beautiful pieces of music. And it was written to bring, I don't know I'm getting choked up, but it was written to bring God glory. And it was written to, um, uh, Handel says it was written to, um, it was written for the express purpose of spreading the gospel and bringing God glory. 
You see this in architecture. You see the old, beautiful um, cathedrals. They were dedicated and built to God. They were built with care and, and uh, amazing details to the construction. It took hundreds of years, and this, this um, value was put in it. And it was done, built beautifully for the honor of God. But we see this from the psalmist as well, and it's fulfilled by Solomon, right? We see the psalmist once to, once he realized he had built himself a house and he had done something for himself, he had created something for himself, he realized, I want to build something for the honor and the glory of God. And so he set off to try to build a, a beautiful temple. Now, he didn't get to do it. It was Solomon. But Solomon got to fulfill this. He got to use the creative juices that God gave and provides each person to build this thing of beauty in order to point people upwards and, and, and remind them of the beauty of God. But we can also see it go the other way. We can see what happened when Aaron constructed the golden calf. Now, of itself, it was, the material was supposed to be beautiful, but it was, it was a, a thing that was ugly and took away from the glory of God. And it's interesting, as we, as we progress in the, down through the ages, we see beauty beginning to take a back seat. We see the art, even uh, the, the beauty of uh, music 100 years ago, much more than what there is generally today. We see music um, going down. As you, as you trade the dedication of a thing for the glory of God and you begin to pursue and, and do it for secular or other means or even to serve the enemy, uh, you, what you begin to see is the integration of ugliness and filth and disgusting things. Um, you see it in art. You see it and you hear it in music. You see it in entertainment. Um, I was, I was uh, just seeing what was on the top charts on Spotify the other day, unrelated to the preparation for the sermon. And I was looking down the list. And I was like, everything's got an E on it, E for explicit. I was like, everything's got an E. There's like two songs on here that don't have that. And um, what you don't see so much these days um, is beauty because I think that we're taking away what it is we're dedicated to. Now, you can hear beautiful Christian music, and I would propose that that is because it is for the glory and to the dedication of God. Now, I want to take us and oh, just want to set that stage a little bit for, for beauty and what it is and why we are as a society and a culture focusing on that and to be thinking and considering what is it that we're, what is the reason behind why we're doing that? And then I want to replace that, knowing that we have that desire for it, knowing that we want to look in, in things and pursue and seek it. I want us to be cognizant of the beauty and the worthiness and the majesty of our King and of God and of our Lord. And so I want to take us to the throne room of God. Now, Ezekiel had to go some, through some really, really strange things. He was probably one of the more, um, the prophets who had to go through some of the hardest stuff at least in my opinion, as you read the book, uh, had to cook his food on, on animal waste. Uh, he had to um, uh, lay on his side for like half a year or something, or maybe it was a full year. I can't remember. There was a lot of stuff he had to do, a lot of pantomiming, a lot of things that were just very difficult, and it would have made him um, come off as completely foolish or like, a, like an insane person. Uh, but God paid him back in spades because he was one of the few people who, through vision, um, was able to see into the throne room and the inner machinations and workings of heaven itself and see God in his glory through this vision. So I want to take us there. Let's go to Ezekiel 1, verse 26. Ezekiel 1, verse 26. And it says... And above the firmament, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne. And if you want to close your eyes and imagine this, that's fine. I'll read it to you. It's up to you. But I want us to get a vision of what is going on up in heaven. And above the firmament, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. And on the likeness of the throne was the likeness with an appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward I saw, as it were, the color of amber, with the appearance of fire all around it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of brightness with brightness all around it. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord Yahweh. So when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. 
Now, if we fast forward several chapters to, to chapter 43 now. He's in another vision. And he's in the temple, the Lord's dwelling place. It says, afterwards, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters and the earth shone with his glory. And it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Kebar. And I fell on my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. The spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me. And he said to me, son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. No more shall the, um, no more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name nor their kings by their harlotry or with the carcasses of their kings on their high places. I don't have anything to add, so we'll keep reading in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 8, verse 2. This is in the temple, and he says, Then I looked, and there was a likeness in the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his waist and downward, and fire from his waist and upward, like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. So yesterday I was out working, um, trying to get everything on the property ready for the freeze. I was picking up plants and moving them into uh, the greenhouse. And there in one of the, the trees that we had in the little pot was something just reflective and shiny and brilliant with a metallic appearance that caught my eye. I looked down a little closer and it was a, um, what's called a jewel beetle. It was, it was, it was deceased. It was no longer but it was still there, and this thing, it, it was a little bug. It was maybe the size of my thumbnail, but it was brilliant and shiny and metallic, and the colors were shifting. If you've ever seen like a, a shark skin paint on, on, a, on a car, and the, the, the colors would shift, and it was just reflective and metallic and beautiful, and you'd think nothing like that is in nature, but it is, and there it was. And then I was want to say that the reason I bring that up is because it caused me to stop what I was doing and look at it, and I was in the, very much in the middle of this work, and pick it up. And then walk it inside and say, everybody, look at this. This is amazing. And um, if we can do that for a beetle, how much more for he who created the beetle, who shines forth with the, the brilliance of fire and light and rainbow and amber, and he's on this throne that, that is unapproachable, except save for the fact that we can approach it through um, the, the grace that is shown to us. So... Thank you for doing Revelation Song. Um, that actually covers the scriptures. We want to kind of cover up this whole, or not cover up, but wrap up this um, throne room. If you go to Revelation 4, verse 2, John is given a vision of, uh, yeah, Revelation 4, of uh, Christ on his throne. And it says, Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. And we're not told what those are. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. I want to stop there and say, I don't think of that as something beautiful. I don't know about you all. I don't think of that as beautiful. But I think when we see it, we will, we will understand otherwise. Um, in our human understanding, it doesn't sound beautiful. But God puts such attention and detail into the eye and speaks of it so much that there has to be something about this that, that actually is beautiful. Picking up in verse 7. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. 
The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come, and whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and who worship him and who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You were worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist, and they were created. This Lord we serve, this God we serve, this Jesus we serve is so beautiful in all of his ways. In his exalted and glorified state, he sits in heaven and awaits the revealing as we await the revealing. And he will bring one day on the day when he returns, we will get to see him in his fullness and his glory and see him as he is. And there will be such a wonderful and awesome time that we, we just don't even know what to make of it, do we? I want to talk about what, what this beauty does and, and this glory and majesty does and how we ought to be affected by it and how we are affected by it, how others in the Bible were affected by it. So let's go over to First Chronicles 1629. First Chronicles 1629. It breaks into the thought saying, give to the Lord his glory, do his name, bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. So his beauty is not just found in his appearance, but in his holiness. And we're to respond to it by worshiping him. Flip over to 2 Chronicles 7, verse 1. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 1. This is when Solomon, which we already talked about, but had, is dedicating the temple. And uh, they're inviting God to make his home there. I believe this is where, uh, you know, it doesn't matter, but this is, this is where God was going to make basically his footstool and his abode uh, so that he could be among men. And he says, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple and the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children saw how the fire came down, the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement. And worshiped and praised the Lord God, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. If we see the beauty and the glory of God, his majesty and his splendor, his excellence, I don't know if we have a choice, frankly. I think it has and forces us to our knees. It will drive, um, it says that everyone will bow the knee, whether, and I, when it says everyone in the other verse, I believe that means everyone, whether they know Jesus or accept Jesus or despise Jesus. But his appearance and his splendor and his glory, how can anyone help but stand? So it drives us to our knees. And seeing his glory and power drives the people to worship, to sing, to fall to the pavement, and just to pour out praises and, glor and uh, to glorify him. Turn back to 1 Chronicles 29. Chronicles 29 and verse uh, 10, breaking in midway through 10. This is David's praise to God. Um, he says, blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Yahweh, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you reign over all, and in your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. This power and this glory it gives us, drives us to give him thanks, too. Why should we be grateful for something like this? Would we be so grateful to worship lesser gods? Lesser gods will let us down. The glory and the majesty... And the beauty of God will never let us down. It will always be there. It will always be strong. It will always be more wonderful than we can comprehend. And then David talks about this in Psalm 96. Apologies for all the, the turning, but I, I want to focus on Scripture today. Psalm 96 and verse 5. Verse 5. 
For the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord Yahweh made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to Yahweh, O families of the people. Give to Yahweh glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship Yahweh in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. How are we to respond? To give praise and offerings and worship and fear and trembling. This is the good kind of fear. The kind where we, we shake because we don't even understand the power that's before us. In the uh, second commandment, have we ever wondered why, why it says we're not to make an image of God? There's several reasons really, but uh, just to recap it, it says you should not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is under heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And you shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. If we were to try to make a, a visage or uh, to capture the glory and the essence of God, it would fall so terribly short that it would actually detract from who he is and take away from his glory and his name. And, not, and on top of that, we would then have the proclivity because we're human, to make that the God. Maybe not the picture itself, but the image and the vision of who that is. And now that's our vision of God and it falls so far short. So God doesn't want any of it. He says, just stay clear of that because if you're going to make something, it's going to fall short of me and then you're going to think that's me and that's not going to be worshiping who I am. Now contrast all that all that we just talked about, this is just a snippet. You could go through the Bible and, and look at these words, majesty, glory, beauty, um, uh, beautiful, etc., and do like a topical study on that. But just consider all these, this, this little snapshot we're trying to put together verbally uh, of who God is. And of course it falls so short. It's falling so short. Uh, I knew it would fall short. And I didn't expect anything less because how else can we describe him? The, the Bible writers have tried to describe him. They had the first person account. Uh, I can't do any better. We just want to recite what the Bible people have said, the writers of the Bible who actually had these experiences. But now I want to contrast the genuine beauty of the Lord versus the beauty that the world offers. The beauty that the world offers, everyone knows this, but it's just a facade. We, the enemy himself was created to be the most beautiful of all the created beings of the archangels, and he even still presents himself as beautiful, as an angel of light, and that's kind of the nature of what the beauty of this earth is in many ways. We saw it with the Pharisees when Jesus said to them, you know, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. We'll back it up, actually. Let's start in Matthew 23, verse 25. Matthew 23, and verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you like, are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but are inside full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's the nature of sin, and that's the nature of the beauty that this world can offer us when things are not done for the glory of God, what ends up happening is we do things for the glory of ourselves to self-glorify so that people would look at us and say, look at something special about him, but we're putting on a facade. That beauty of this world would be a facade, and inside is all manner of filth and disgusting things. And that's the nature of the beauty of what the world presents to us. Not the beauty of creation, but the beauty of things that lead to sin, right? Right? Look at, the, look at the great cities of the world. If you've traveled around um, uh, New York City or Las Vegas, they're some of the, considered some of the, I guess, the great cities of the modern world. Um, if you've ever been to Las Vegas, it's so impressive when you first get there. It's, it's beautiful in its own way. It's got all the, the lights and everything's flashing and um, it's, it's alluring. And then you spend about a day there and you, you have some fun and you have some really good food and you wake up the next day and you're like, yeah. It's flashing lights, it's okay. And then by day three, you're like, let's get out of here. And what happens is you begin to see the facade coming down. You see the lights and all the flashing things that capture your attention and make you look at first. 
But then you look at the ground and you see trash and refuse. You see advertisements that people have littered on, on the floor for escorts and, and um, unseemly things. And you look and you see that there's just so much that is dirty about the city. And then the allure of the lights begins to wear off. And it's the same with New York City too. You, you go down to Times Square and it's beautiful. And you see all the sights and you see all the sights and you walk a couple streets over and you're in a red light district or something similar to that where it's very gross and you have people trying to pull you into their establishments, talking up the, their, the business and what, what they have. And they're, the allure goes really quickly down and you see the homeless and the homelessness, the problems there with the homeless and the people who are living on the streets and the, the, all these things. And suddenly the allure of how beautiful the city is, the city that brings many people to want to live there, and I want to make it in New York City and have the romance and all the stuff associated with New York City, it begins to lose its beauty because it's nothing. It's a facade. And that's the legacy of beauty that the world offers. It's sin wrapped in alluring, seemingly beautiful shell, but it's a form of beauty with evil underpinnings. And it's a promise that cannot deliver, and will not satisfy. And ultimately, that's what leads us so often is to sin. You see something that's either beautiful or tempting or desirable, and you believe the lie that you tell yourself that leads us to that. When we say that, you believe the lie. When you see, you look at something beautiful and you say, I want that. And you believe the lie that you tell yourself, that will make me happy, or that will make me satisfied, or that will make me full, filled up. But it's always a lie. Because there's only one that can do that. And he is the most beautiful and the most glorious and the most majestic. And then you fill yourself with that. There will not be room for the others. Nor will they compare. And I think that's the, that's the balancing act that we have to do. Really, it shouldn't be a balancing act. Really, we should be completely weighted down in a good sense with the glory of God. So that the other stuff doesn't even register on the scales. But really, the... the, the, the if we can keep our focus on God, not just on his laws and statutes and testimonies and, and um, all these things, but on his beauty and who he is and believe that he is what is forever and he is what is eternal. There is no lying with him. There's, if you serve him and serve him for his majesty and his beauty alone, he will never let you down. Men desire beautiful cars, beautiful women. That can lead us to a place of lust. Women desire, I don't know, beautiful homes, a really nice vacuum. I don't know. What is it? You tell me. I'm not a woman. I don't know. <laughs> a beautiful home. We'll go with that. I want a big, beautiful barn. And these things are what we lead to lust or covetousness. And you, you, you get them and you finally get them and attain them. And you realize, oh, that was, it's not all I thought it was going to be. And that you fill in the blank. Fill in the sin. Fill in the item that we tend to idolize and, and make the object of our, our worship because of the beauty or because of what we think is the splendor and majesty that it offers us. And what's interesting about all this is because we've been giving all of these different descriptions of God and of, of Jesus as the king, Yahweh, who came in such glory and is in a state of such glory. But that's not how he came when he arrived on earth. We all know this, but let's go to Isaiah 53. This beautiful paradox that Jesus, and there's a reason, I think so as well. Well, it tells us what the reason is. Let's just read it. Isaiah 53 and verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, Jesus, shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and I looked that up. It means magnificence, splendor, or beauty. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. We serve a God who was not only just willing to walk away from all of this glory, that he was described as having before his appearance on earth. But he was willing to become the opposite. He was willing to walk away from that and then become an opposite, born in a manger where it's dirty and gross and smells. And 
to come up in a place, um, sort of a desolate, sort of small, nowhere town. Um, it says that he was a, uh, a root out of dry ground. God wants us to look at him. Jesus wants us to look at him and love him for the right reasons. I think that, and it says that essentially, but that's why, why else would he have been of no appearance, no description, no splendor? If you look at him and, and saw a plain, normal person and yet still believed, blessed are you, because even though you saw him in the flesh, blessed is he who sees, does not see, and yet believes. They were not seeing him in his glorified form, and yet they believed. And yet, he gave us a glimpse of it. Um, when Luke 9.29, he took a couple of his followers. In Luke 9.29, it said, As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. So he gave these indications to at least a couple of his disciples who were then able to tell others and us about it. That he turned into this beautiful, glorified being that God said, Serve him. That's my son. Serve him. God, who at various times and in various ways, Hebrews 1, spoke in time past by the fathers and prophets, has in these last days spoken to us through his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on the high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And so I want to let, as Psalm 90 verse 17 says, to let the beauty, the delight, the splendor, the grace of the Lord our God be upon us, to establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. I hope that as we go forward, when we, when, we want, when we say, let's look at Jesus and take our mind off the things of this earth and the things of this world and look at him, stare at him, we can't literally stare at him. What we can do is understand who this king is, this king of glory, this king of majesty. He's worthy and awesome and mighty. He's worthy of all of our praise. He's worthy that we would fall down and worship him. Or we would not get caught up in the daily grind and pursuit of things that are beautiful or may want to drive our earthly walks, the, the things that vie for our time throughout the day. This king, who is so worthy of praise, and I can't remember which biblical character, one of the authors in the Old Testament, uh, when they saw Jesus, or saw the Yahweh, they said, I'm, I'm undone. The, the Lord who undoes us, and then picks us back up, and sets us on our feet, and tells us to come, Isaiah, thank you. That's Isaiah. But he picks us back up. And that's the God we get to worship. I'm going to close with Jude um, 1 in verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be all the glory and the majesty and the dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. God, we want to come before you and just thank you for who you are. You are, you are beautiful and majestic and we can't wait to see you for who you are until then words will have to do. We do ask that you would give us as you, as you see fit and as you see fit to inspire us and to draw us nearer to you. If you would even give us visions and, and dreams of who you are that we may see you in those forms until the days that we can see you. But whether you do or you don't, help us just to keep our eyes fixed on you. The idea of you as a great and awesome king because that is who you are. And you are so much more powerful than we know and so much greater than we know. May we never replace you with the fake things of this earth, the beauty, beautiful things of this earth that they would never take the place of who you are. If there's something that is truly beautiful, you have created it. And yet, as the enemy likes to do, he likes to take that which is beautiful and corrupt it and act as though it is something it is not. So we ask that you would help us to build beautiful lives for our families, that we would set the things of worth behind them, that everything would be done to your glory, 
the things of beauty that we set up would glorify you, not glorify ourselves, but they'd be worthy for you and, and uh, to bring you glory. We just thank you. We ask that you would lift up uh, each and every one of us as we go through this walk, that we keep our eyes on the things of value, the things of worth, and that we would see through the deceptions of this earth and the, the facades that are put up. Keep our eyes fixed on you. We love you. And say this in Jesus' name. Amen.